there folks and welcome or welcome back to Nippon Trading International's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host Ziv Nakajima again and this podcast is brought to you among others by Emil Gorgis of realestate.jp. He's a Tokyo real estate agent who specializes in serving international or mixed nationality families who are looking for the perfect family home. So Emil's an Australian, he's been living here in Japan for over two decades now, and for about half of that time he's been buying, selling, and managing real estate properties in Tokyo on behalf of his own family and a great many happy clients. And he also acts as a mortgage broker on behalf of his clients. So he's got dedicated loan officers in many of the Japanese mega banks. And if you're a regular listener of the podcast, you probably already know him from our JREP, the Japan Real Estate Experts Panel Sessions which means that you're already aware of the fact that the man is an absolute fountain of wisdom on all things related to real estate in Japan, and in particular to family homes, the greater Tokyo metropolitan area, and mortgages. And most importantly, he's incredibly generous with his time and advice, which he's more than happy to provide at no cost or commitment to anyone asking. So if you've been thinking about buying your home in Tokyo, but you've been sitting on the fence for a while, or you just want to have a chat in English with a real expert, Drop him a line on sales at realestate.jp. Hit him up today and start exploring your options. All right, and we are back. I know you heard this before about a month ago. My deepest apologies, but my PC, which is also my audio and video editing platform, as much of it as I do, um, has kicked the bucket once more. And I was eagerly awaiting its return from the shop. Well, it is now back in full operational mode. And so you can enjoy my deep baritone voice in your ears once more. I just know you've missed me, haven't you? All right, so getting right back into it. This is a conversation that I've had late last year with a super cute US-based couple. He's American, she's Japanese, and they're now looking at their very first property investment, not just first in Japan, but first ever for them. So they wanted to know everything from the very basic stuff all the way to the minute little details of how it all works. And so we talk about real estate investment generally, how it compares to other investment assets, how to plan ahead for investment and retirement, and how to open a bank account in Japan, which leads us to talk about Jumihyo, the Japanese address certificates, um, which bank to choose when you do, how to use foreign exchange providers to save money when you're remitting funds into and out of Japan, and then a bit more of a drill down into the actual purchase itself. So what to consider when buying your first investment property in Japan, Um, singles or couple-sized properties versus family-sized ones, what makes Japanese real estate attractive to investors overall. And we also talk a bit about potential investment in parking lots as opposed to residential or commercial properties, um, when to resell your properties and how to get your money back, how old should the properties be both on purchase and on sale, and qualifying for mortgages, and if you don't qualify, what and where can you actually buy for 5 to 10 million Japanese yen, so under 100,000 US, viewing properties and checking out locations before purchase, due diligence research, calculating yields, negotiations, and tenanted versus occupied, and also the logistics of it all. How long does the purchase process actually take? What do our services at NTI include and how much do they cost? What's included in our deal analysis spreadsheet and how it all works? And we covered insurance policies, what types exist, what do they cover? So really a bit of everything. Really good introduction to property investment here in Japan, I thought at least. I hope you enjoy the conversation and I'll see you again on the other side. Yep, cool. So... What what sort of property for what purpose? Where are you living now? What are you uh, um, to do? so we so we live in upstate New York, uh, maybe two hours past Albany. Okay. And Sari's family is in Hiratsuka, which is okay. Kanagawa. Kanagawa. In yep. yeah. So we're looking for a pro- uh, so basically an investment property. Um, the United States started raising interest rates, as, as I'm sure you're aware of. Yep. And, and we um cashed out like. And now we're looking to um, park some of our investments. It's kind of weird because I thought with the inflation rate in the United States at what what it was, I thought the dollar would go down internationally and gold would go up. So I've been I've been stocking gold and silver for, for since two thousand eight, and you know with quantitative easing and everything, I I thought it was going to be a repeat, right? That you know everyone would sell the dollar and gold would go up. But it actually happened in reverse. Now, now the dollar, this purchasing power, 
to the yen is like 142 to, to one. So I thought, while, while in my opinion, I think the dollar is overvalued. And I, and I, and I think when people realize that uh, the dollar will, will go back to parity to the yen. So I want while while the dollar is overpriced, I want to invest that in property and get some tangible assets and get away from like crypto and all that craziness. I've long since given up trying to figure out what the dollar or the gold value or the yen will do. I just I just ride them as they come. <laughs> I give up too. I I because I, I thought I had it completely planned it like eight years ago or five years ago. No one could, could convince me otherwise. I thought gold gold would, would go to the moon, but it, it didn't. So yeah. But okay, on, so on flip side, yep. I was just saying on the flip side, the the dollar is really strong in comparison to the yen, and I want to take advantage of that. Yep. So I'm assuming Saudi and um has a bank account in japan still right no 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 i don't okay. have so i can so we're going to japan uh from december 3rd to yep. january 3rd. january 6th around there right. so i can make a bank account yep and i also want to know which bank you recommend well, to make it, to to open a bank account, you need to first have a, a Jumihyo, right? You need to tell yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. That... I, I will switch Jumihyo when I get okay. there. Yeah. Yeah. So I have no problem to make it. Um, which bank account? I don't think it matters that much. Mm -hmm. Um, recently, online banks are a thing, and they've been in many aspects a lot more convenient to work with because you don't need to walk into the branch with a hanko every time you need to to extend yeah. your credit or, or anything like that. Um, so you could try with one of the online banks. If you do that, just make sure, sorry, I'm working from home today. So these guys, are, <laughs> 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 um, but you, um, you could maybe apply even before you get to Japan or not, not apply because they'll also need a Jumihio, but maybe just look at the requirements before you come to Japan. And then as soon as you arrive, you could apply to one of those. Okay. Um, Sony Bank is a good one. Uh, GMO um, is easy to apply for, but I think they don't accept overseas transfers. So you probably want a, a bank account that will let you transfer and receive funds from overseas. Yes. Um, I heard even uh, the the post office bank is is quite easy to open an account with, and you just walk into any post office branch, and they definitely uh, send and receive from overseas. Okay. If you want a bit more English um, enabled online banking, then again, Sony Bank is one of them. Shinsei also have, I think, an online fully English or partly English. It could be complete Japanese because. Uh... Yeah. She can handle all of that. <laughs> okay. Well, as, as long as you, yeah. yeah. But in that case, any bank would do. I would definitely maybe try to get one online bank account and one standard like physical bank account. Mm. Okay. While you're there, I mean, why not? Um, mm -hmm. I think UFJ. If you want a mega bank, UFJ are quite easy in the sense that you can walk into a branch and just open an account. If you def definitely, if you're a native Japanese, with mm -hmm. a Jumihyo. Yep. But otherwise, they're all all really the same, I think. Okay. Okay. So you once you open a bank account, or or you're coming just you're coming very soon, so you should be able to. So once you open a bank account, regardless of whether you've already got a property lined up that you want to purchase or not, it's probably a very good idea because the rates are so attractive now. It's probably a very good idea to open a bank account and exchange your dollars into yens. Um, as soon as possible and then just even if you have the money sitting there it's still better than having it suddenly lose 10 yen per dollar in a few months time in case it drops i mean nobody knows but now it's definitely historically low so why not exchange now right yeah and then i, I remember on your um when he, your guest he was asking um banks versus um i think you said fx uh currency uh what was currency would exchange be better provider? Right? yes yeah. yeah so that do you, and I and you said you had a relationship with one of them. I can't remember the the name, but we work with OFX. Yeah, I can send you the link to sign up with them. It'll give you um, just a smoother onboarding process and access to our account manager, and also slightly better rates. 
But whichever whichever of them you sign up with doesn't matter. Just don't let the bank exchange it for you because they'll always screw you by at least two, three, or more like three, five yen to a dollar. Okay. We want to avoid that. <laughs> yeah. So I'll send you the link. You can sign up with OFX. You can also compare price. Uh, Wise, Wise is another big one. Mm -hmm. um, but with Wise, you're limited to 1 million yen transfers, I think. So that means every time you transfer into Japan, the receiving bank will charge you, depending on the size of the transfer, probably around 4, 000, 3, 4,000 yen. So with WISE, if you're transferring, for example, 20 million yen, it'll be 20 million times 4,000 every time because they only allow you to remit 1 million at a time. So probably OFX or Compass or one of the other ones are better for bigger transfers. Okay. If we want to make a big transfer, so we'll probably go with OFX. Yeah, I'll send you the, the link to sign up with it. Okay, and then what, what sort of property were you thinking of buying? Okay, so, all right, so I have notes here. So so I, I so I definitely want a mansion. It, it, it seems like the right move for us. And and I, I think on your opening presentation, you said affordability, high yielding investment, and, and that that sentence really resonated with me so so i would like i think we would want to mention that and i don't think we want a family um wait, wait but I, i'm still lost are we talking investment property or investment, property. You, investment. investment property okay okay, okay. I'm with yeah you. investment yeah. property yeah yep. yeah um because i think we're still going to be living in the states for quite a while well family family size mansion units um They'll cost more to renovate and repair between tenants just because they're bigger. So then there's more to the interior that needs to be done between tenants. Mm -hmm. um, but if you happen to get a good family tenant, they'll stay in place for many, many years and they'll take very good care of the property as opposed to a single, which I mean, the, they, the turnover is higher with the singles or the couples. And also if it's an elderly single, they don't always take really good care of the property. Not not by being malicious or damaging, just you know, keeping the windows closed and always smoking inside, especially if it's a man. So th there's advantages to bigger family sized units, but the yield will be lower because of the uh, higher maintenance between tenants, and because of the fact that as they get bigger, the price goes up, but the rent doesn't go up as much. So they will yield less. Um, but they're safer and stabler, so there's something to be said. Oh, to okay. Because I, I guess when I was listening to the presentation, I I thought you said that it's harder to fill them um, when they do leave. Yes, where... but they stay, but they stay for a longer time. Okay, so that's the okay. It takes a bit longer to fill them in, but they do stay. I mean, it takes a few months extra to fill in a family size unit, but they stay in place for a few years extra. So. Well, if it, in your expertise, if it is more stable, <laughs> that's what I'm going to go for. So basically, my career, I'm a programmer, and I teach um, actually two jobs now. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking for something that requires minimum <laughs> intervention by me. Yeah. As so passive if, as they come. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So I'm looking for something safe, high yielding. I um, can't. Look, better quality tenants and better quality yeah. properties are less headache and less um, hands-on. Mm -hmm. But you, what you sacrifice is the yield. You, you get lower yield for that. Yeah, and I'm fine with that for the first property. Um, if I can sleep good at night, <laughs> I'm fine with a, a lower yield. Uh, it's it's Japan. You'll sleep good at night. It's not like there's going to be <laughs> yeah. drug labs and squatters. I know. The United States has and, yeah. <laughs> I know what it's like in the US. No, none of that happens here. So you'll sleep well. I mean, the only headaches you might have is um, if a, you know, a unit stays vacant for a little bit longer or if you got a single elderly tenant, the worst headache is if they die in the property, right? That can sometimes happen in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, but insurance is pretty good for those cases. So headaches in the sense of you'll have to constantly be on the phone and wonder what's happening. That's not going to happen in Japan. Wonderful. Wonderful. I, I want a predictable, as, as predictable as it can be. That's one of the main reasons people come here is the stability and quiet of it all. Yeah. So, so initially when we got married in Japan, I, I, I was telling her father that I always want to buy a coin parking lot. Cause like, okay. I was just, cause I just thought, 
easier. It's easier, right? Um, you know, land is there's a scarcity of land, so I thought buy a coin parking lot. I don't you don't have to deal with any humans. And then we first went on our uh, parking lot, but it, it it seemed to be very hard to find a decent parking lot. And everywhere, and her friend who was in real estate um, directed us to look into um, buying a mansion and being and renting it out. So then it started us on our journey. <laughs> well, the purchase process is less passive with the park. I mean, he's right. You need to search longer and harder until you find the right one. Mm -hmm. But um, as you rightfully mentioned, once you get started, it's it's very low maintenance and very passive. Um, but it is, I mean, it's passive from a, uh, let's call it troubleshooting perspective. There's not much maintenance. There's no tenants moving in and out. None of that. It's just... Mm -hmm asphalt and the occasional like boom thing to fix but from from a um, mental bandwidth perspective it is more time consuming because it's a business so every month you need to examine how much money you've received it's going to ebb and flow with you know season depending on location maybe seasonality maybe because people are just not coming out as much so it's different in the sense that you do need to keep your eye on the bottom line every month a bit more uh, frequently and you need to maybe tweak your prices or consider renting out by the month if you're not getting enough coin uh, customers. So that there's stuff to think about. It's not passive in that sense. And also the yield is a lot lower. I mean, if you're not building a multi-story parking thing, you're probably yeah. like, if you just stay on the ground level, you, get maybe three percent at best um yeah. real estate will usually start at four five six percent i know and, and once i saw yeah when we were looking and we saw the yield of like three percent in the united states i can get i can get four percent in least, a season yeah. yeah so i was like yeah so i was like <laughs> that's what sorry wife said she's like you could just put in a cd and get four percent i was like you're right so we kind of just scrapped that idea and, and yeah and we, we also so i have a question so how feasible is it? Because like my dream is um, we have two young girls and like in my imagination, like we have this property and they're like, dad, you know, we want to spend this, you know, they're only four years old now. So in 20 years, yeah. <laughs> they're like, dad, yeah. we, we want to stay in Japan. Right. I'm like, oh, well, we have a couple of apartments there. And I know um, after a while, apartments, you know. The longevity of the apartment just depreciates and sometimes they're you're not gonna down. be holding the same apartments in 20 years time no absolutely you're gonna so, be so. Re resell you're gonna be reselling buying fresh fresh ones where you you know you get the age factor a bit younger again and you also you roll in your purchase expenses and you carry them forward for three years to claim as tax deductions Okay. But after three years, that cycle ends. So a lot of people after um, five years, when the capital gains tax becomes normal, because if you resell within five years, you're paying double capital gains tax, which is not a huge concern in Japan unless something suddenly happens and we'll all gain in value. But just in case, people usually keep them for five years, which is when capital gains tax is, goes back to normal. It's doubled before that because the government is preventing speculation. And then after five years, because the property got older and because they can't claim any more of their purchase costs, a lot of them, somewhere between five to 10 years, sell them and buy newer ones. Right? And then they can claim the purchase costs all over again, et cetera. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But in so any case, 20 years is a long time to hold the property. It'll get old. Maintenance will become high. You usually cycle them within 10 years, I'd say, at most. So then if you're getting like 5% yield and you're, you're cycling it every five years. No, no, you're not cycling every five years. But I mean, I'm to, sorry. Yeah. You want to consider it after, let's say, five, seven, eight years. You want to consider shuffling them around and getting new ones. Okay, would you be profitable then? Because because I, I always thought like it would take you 20 years if you're getting 5% to get your money back. So then. Yeah, but I mean, when you sell, you get your money back. So what you earned within those five years is 5%. Let's say it's 5%. 5% times five years is already 25%. Okay. Plus you get your money back or very close to it. So you've definitely gained in value. And it doesn't have to be five years again. I'd say within 10 years, people usually consider selling it. So then the yield would have to appreciate more than the depreciation of the, of the to make up for the depreciation, right? Because you're not, because in the, the market. 
the depreciation is the depreciation of the structure and it's a tax how can i put it it's a tax perspective on how you can pay less tax because the structure depreciated in value and it's a loss on paper but the actual value of the property when you sell it is not necessarily going to be lower okay um, because, because the land holds its value or the land could even gain in value i mean it's japan it doesn't happen as often but for example central tokyo central osaka have actually gained very significantly in value in the last um 10 years or so right they're back well, to a pre, pre-bubble day so nobody cares about the structure in japan we care about what happens to the land so to give you an example our customers for example we've been at it for about 11 years so a fair few of our customers have already sold and you know gotten back their capital or better when they sold so usually i'd say assume about the same price when you sell a property in japan don't assume it'll gain in value in most cases it's not going to lose in value if it does it's going to be similar to what you might gain so maybe somewhere between five to fifteen percent gain or loss Okay, so that's not plus bad whatever you gained in rental income by that time. Nice, nice. Yeah. So, so the the ten years to get your investment back is if you're keeping the. Pro- it's not going to be ten years. It's going to be more like fifteen or sixteen years. That's mm-hmm. if you keep holding your investment for fifteen, sixteen years, not selling it. Then by the end of the time, you already got your money back. But that's again your money back plus all the rental income you've accrued during that time. So. We don't look at just the value. We look at how much you got when you sold it, and we look at how much you gained in rental income by that time. Okay. Thank you for that. Sorry, if it's too many numbers and stuff, I I can try to slow down. No, I know. I know. I'm following pretty well. I I appreciate that because so then we would just have to keep rebuying and reselling and stuff, but we still can give them a place to live over time. You don't have to, but if they get to the point where, let's say, the building is 40, 45, 50 years old, they're less attractive to tenants, the the building costs, the, the building fees that you pay every month go up because the owner union has more to maintain and repair. And around that time, the owner union itself will start considering selling the whole lot off to developers because it's getting too expensive to maintain. So you, you usually you're not going to get to a property getting beyond 45, maybe. I mean, we don't have anything 50 years old, but I guess we could get there at some point. I mean, us mm-hmm. or our customers. You wouldn't usually go far beyond that. Usually you'd resell them or the entire building will be sold before they reach that age. Got it. Got it. But um, yeah, but I mean, being a property investor, the, the, the term passive income is misleading because you're always fine tuning your portfolio. You're selling something, you're buying something, you're expanding, you're diversifying to different locations. There's again, there's mental bandwidth involved. Don't expect it to be completely hands off. Okay. So that's good. And that's a good reality check because I was. <laughs> but so. So I have another question. So is this a, a feasible a feasible strategy is that we do have a um because I do want to take advantage of low interest rates in Japan because it's like almost free money. But the problem is we don't work in Japan. So yeah. could we use the rental property income as a way to show after a couple of years to, to show the bank we have income because they won't be able to verify my income in the U.S.? Can we use that after a couple of years and assuming that they don't raise interest rates? As a non on? as a non-resident, that would be challenging. What about her and her name? So the op- the feasible option would be maybe if Saudi son um if she's actually residing in the country and the properties are all under her name, um or, or both of your names, but if it's both of your names, they'll calculate that as 50% income, right? Because another the guy gene is taking 50% to the US and 50% yeah. remains to the Japanese, right? So if Saudi um has residency and maintains her residency, meaning the immigration department thinks or she is physically in Japan, then that would be considered a Japanese income history. But in any case, without residency or without having an incorporated entity that's residing, so to speak, in Japan, they're not going to give you a loan. So okay. you have so, to live here and make money here. So you're satisfying the making money here requirement. Um, but first of all, 
depending on how many properties you've got, how much income they're generating, how much the bank will lend you, depending on the properties you're planning to purchase, it might not be a huge amount. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is um, somebody or a company need to actually be living physically present in Japan. Okay. Okay. So that, that that's a big hurdle then. <laughs> okay. Cause we, we were, I was hoping that we could use leverage, you know, the income from the property to, borrow out someone else's money you yeah. could if you moved here for a few years got the loan and then they're not going to recheck it to see if you're still in the country or not once the loan is in place and you're making payments that's it but to mm -hmm. kick it off you need to appear as if you're residents with at least one two years of income in japan okay and is there a way where we could make it look like she's living in japan or <laughs> <laughs> uh, again once you've applied for a jumihyo or a bank account or a yeah. loan um, and you were in Japan at that time I don't think anybody yeah. checks it again later okay. is okay. maybe the best advice I can give <laughs> okay I got it I got it Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah I get it Thank you. okay okay Okay, so I want to shift gears and and and, and talk about I want to like what a, apartments I qualify for. So I want to do obviously a cash purchase um, for the first one. Yep. And I was thinking between fifty thousand to a hundred thousand US, and and I always suck at converting it. Like, would it be a hundred that a hundred five to ten million normally? Now it's a bit more yeah. than that. Yeah. So. So would that put me at, at like the middle level or like or like the because because I, I know because I, I read your book the ebook and you were saying that you can get an apartment for like twenty to thirty thousand. Um, you can. So I'm nice. assuming. <laughs> yeah. I, but if, but if I went up like to like maybe fifty or to a hundred. Yeah. Like, well, so a hundred a hundred US at the moment is about fourteen million yen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, I'm assuming that's going to be the total budget, including all purchase costs, right? Yes. Yeah. So if we factor in, let's say, a worst case scenario, let's say 18% purchase cost, if you're using a company like ours, mm -hmm. and if the uh, the property is valued higher than market price. So we always assume worst, worst, worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be... In that case, 118%, which means the actual listing price is going to be about 11, 11 and a half million yen. Okay. So that's going to buy you um, a small, well-located, um, older Tokyo studio or one bedroom. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Um, or something a bit bigger and newer in any other city, I would say. I mean, central Osaka may be about the same as, as you know, general Tokyo. But otherwise, yeah, even suburban Osaka, Kobe, Fukuoka, Nagoya, um, Kyoto, Sapporo, Yokohama, Chiba, Saitama, um, maybe Kawasaki for lucky, probably Kawasaki would all be locations that I would flag for something a little bit bigger and nicer and newer compared to central mm -hmm. Tokyo, Osaka. Um, so it would be, hello. So it would be a bit beyond um, entry level. I'd say good, nice, mm -hmm. stable cash cow, but not too miserable kind of thing. We interrupt this broadcast to tell you about Tokyo Family Stays. They're a short-term rentals company in Tokyo and they offer a home away from home experience, which is just perfect for remote working, quarantining, if that's still a thing, or if you just need somewhere quiet to get away from the world. They offer a variety of options for families, corporate relocations, or even if you're simply transitioning between homes in Tokyo. The properties are super comfortable, tastefully furnished, fully equipped with all amenities, and they accommodate up to 10 people. So really the only thing you'll need to bring with you is your toothbrush and maybe a change of clothes. They come with fast unlimited wireless internet, dedicated workspaces, and fully equipped kitchens, and they're just a delight to stay in. Fantastic alternative to Japanese business hotels, which if you've ever stayed in one, you probably know they're tiny, they're noisy, 
fine for a night or two if you're on your own, but longer term or with a family, you'll probably feel you're in a jail cell very quickly in a Japanese business hotel. So if you want to give yourself a sense of space and freedom by renting a real home, with comfortable Western beds, including all the necessities like baby bedding, children's toys, high chairs, etc. You definitely want to reach out to Tokyo Family Stays. They've been at it for over a decade. They're a fully licensed minpaku or short-term stay operator. And as a special bonus for our viewers and listeners, they're also throwing in a breakfast basket upon arrival for anyone who books and mentions the Japan Real Estate Podcast or NTI. And not only for guests, if you're a property owner, you've got an investment property that you want to tweak for higher profit, or a holiday home that you want to rent out when you're not using it via short-term stays, drop them a line today, see how they can help you maximize your property's income. And again, as a special bonus to our viewers and listeners, they're also offering a free audit of your existing short-term stay listings without any obligation whatsoever. So feel free to reach out to them at tokyofamilystays.com. Well worth a visit. And again, if you're in the market for a family home in or around the Tokyo metropolitan area, Emil's your man. Don't be shy to reach out to him as well at sales at realestate.jp. And now back to the podcast. Got it. Got it. So would you recommend, because I know you spoke highly of Fukuoka. And uh, getting a little bit pricier here, but not, not Tokyo level still. Yeah. So, Okay. But for us, though, it's hard to see the Fukuoka property. Oh, uh, oh maybe you can do that on uh, Zoom. I kind of so because I know you, you do a lot of like Zoom, um, where like remote show, viewings and that. Yeah, yeah, I I kind of old school where I kind of like want to physically see it and, and like just like picture myself living but there. If owner change um property, you're not gonna see it. Yeah, so. See. But you, yeah, so it, you don't have to see inside, but you can oh, get you, 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 you yeah. can see outside, and you can get a, 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 a feeling of yeah, you know, the the, town. Local, the town, like the personality, the culture. Well, when you're here in November, December, you said. Like, sorry, when when you're here in December, why don't you drop by for a few days, and we'll take yeah. you a tour on a tour around town, I'd and love then. To. Down the track, if I tell you, okay, we found a good property, remember that neighborhood near that thing, you'll know what I'm talking about kind of thing. Yes, I would love to do that. Yeah. yeah. So if... If, if it's Fukuoka find... you're after, but I mean, it, we're happy to do any play. But like Saori well, said, I, I, saying, I, 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 if it's tenanted, there's no meaning of you being here. You're just going to be able to walk around the building. Yeah, so like, I, I kind of just want to walk around the building, yeah, see the local, yeah. Yeah. T- you know, yeah. you know, maybe take a picture of us because it'd, it'd be our first, <laughs> our first property where we can put it. You in can our do house. that after you purchased it too. You know, you can actually come here, stand outside the building. And... <laughs> I kind of want to do that, right? Because like you know, I'm a, I'm a sentimental guy, where I just want to, <laughs> you know. We we do have. I was actually I, when we started the business ten years ago, I thought everybody would be like you. I'm surprised and happy to report that ninety percent of them are not, but we still have ten customers. 10% of our customers who want to physically be there before they actually pull the trigger. So, yeah. Yeah, I want to yeah. just feel it, right? Because it's so, mm. so yeah, so that, it's, it's really exciting for us. Um, um, just to, just to be, have an asset that's outside of the market. Um, mm. because with it, you can't depend on CDs because CD rates just fluctuate, you know, yeah. couple 10 years from now, this, the Federal Reserve could be cutting rates and then you have no saving trade. So I just want to be outside of the market. I have something physical. Um, and then also to connect my kids to Japan um, so that they have a reason to keep coming to Japan because it's a, really important to us that they don't lose their Japanese side of things. And I yep. thought, might as well invest in Japan. We're, we're very happy to be of service. Yeah, and and just so you talked a lot about the the declining population. So so like so obviously an area that that would be interesting, you know, would have a, would obviously have to be a stable um, population because you know that's that's the only like concern that I would have. We wouldn't when we go through the due diligence process with customers and we provide sample properties and they tell us what they think about and we tell them what we think about them and we fine tune the selection 
from the get-go, you wouldn't find any properties in there that are not in areas with stable or growing populations. Um, mm -hmm. We wouldn't even research. I mean, we research, obviously, but when we see one of those cities, we just put it aside. We don't actually go there. So Got it. the potential properties you receive from us will definitely be in those kinds of cities. And if you forward potential properties that you want us to look at, then we'll make recommendations, again, based on the city before we even start digging deeper into anything. So... Japan being Japan, the first rule of thumb when you're choosing any investment property is population decline in that city. And not just population, mm -hmm. like if it's a tiny, tiny city with a single big employer or a single industry, that's also a bit risky, right? So it's maybe something nice you can diversify into when you've got five other stable properties in your portfolio, but definitely not as a first, I'd say. Got it. And then when you do do the search, like I kind of made like a criteria that I would love to have like you know you know can like can the property have something like interesting about it like can it be near a school um we kind of looked at like properties near tokyo university we found out wow it's really expensive but or near a mall or a shopping center somewhere where you know it beats out japanese competitors or um other you know to can't find the right word but like to make it exciting to live there it's um it's um one of the features in every Japanese listings. You'll see them on the website. The agents themselves point out convenience store here, city hall is over there, university okay. over there, supermarket over here. Like you'll always know that. And we further pointed out um in English in the description in the deal analysis. So you feed us your criteria first. Uh -huh. If there's anything in there that's not feasible, we'll let you know. We'll fine tune it. But basically, we'll go we'll base our research on your search criteria and uh, we'll do a few rounds of that where you help point us in the right direction if we've missed something until you'll end up getting exactly what you're looking for as potential well, yeah. wonderful and and then for our budget what kind of yield what kind of safe yield because because i remember one of your old um talks um, a lot of people would chase the high yields and they they wouldn't be as happy as someone um as down the chasing. track yeah um, I'd say five to six percent. Some of them will be yeah. really, really attractive. It will be slightly less than five percent. So it'll be your choice whether you go for those or not. So when you say otherwise, 5%, I'd say five, yeah. five to six, but net before tax. So including all of your purchase uh -huh. and running costs, um, but not including your annual taxes, whatever they might be, depending on how big your portfolio will be, and not including uh, property tax, which we don't know this early in the process. We're only going to find out that amount closer to settlement. Um, and also not including unknown, so maintenance, vacancies, stuff that we can predict in advance. So net pre-tax, probably five to six percent. Okay, that, that's that's really good. Um, any any questions you have, sorry? You'll have a lot more questions once we start looking at actual properties. I promise. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so, and and I know that that you send us a letter, a rule of you know that, that we want to work with you, and as, yeah. As we so work, there's two uh, there's two documents that we need signed and witnessed um, by a notary public by the time we actually representing you in contract signing and stuff like that. So you've got a bit of time to work on them until we actually find uh, the property that we want to apply for. Um, mm -hmm. And we can put in a couple of hours of free research just to give you an idea of what's out there. But once you actually want us to research more hours, dig in deeper, do due diligence, contact sellers, mm -hmm. agents, uh, then we'll need our fee estimate paid. So that'll be based on what you think the budget is at that time. Mm -hmm. And you pay us that amount that represents you until closing. And after closing, we'll credit or debit if the property ended up being pricier or cheaper than the budget you estimated. Then we'll credit or debit our fee accordingly too. And I know you talked about this a lot, um, haggling and trying to get a, and I know Japanese don't necessarily like it, but it, it is there any room for, for negotiating like a couple of percent or is it? Yeah. Complete, yeah you like, can always make, make, you can always make an offer that say up to 10% off the listing price. That's not considered rude even in Japan. Okay. Um, beyond that, some, especially elderly sellers might be offended and just not want to talk to you because it's considered low ball beyond 10%. But we've got yeah. customers who offer a 15% or 20% off. And then if they miss out, they miss out. They don't care. 
So okay. you can always offer politely up to 10% off. Whether it'll be accepted or not depends on, I mean, sellers and agents are not stupid. They know that they could potentially get more, so they might just reject or ignore the offer. But it's it's not rude to put in 10% request now. Got it. Got it. And then and then the, in one of your presentations, you talk about due diligence, learning about the um the management fees, um, you know, how much savings the the, uh, the building has and stuff. Yep. So if you represent us, would you do the due diligence to make sure that that's all not part of the yeah, that's all part of the purchase process and also uh, due diligence on the tenant themselves if they've been there for a while, their um, payment history, their social economic profile, just to make sure that you know they're not going to disappear in a few months. We do, but that, that's all part of the due diligence that we do before a purchase. Yeah. Yeah, and then because I think we want to go with the owner change. Um, um and, and i i know the pros and cons the, the cons would be um you don't know like the state of, of the apartment and obviously the pros would be you have income right away yep and if it's a long-term tenant then you probably can assume they're going to stay for a good few years more at least yeah I, I should just let you know sorry i've got two and a half minutes left on my zoom so we can jump back in there uh, after i save the recording which will take a few minutes so if we get disconnected give me five minutes and i'll jump back in Okay, do, do I just jump jump back in on this link or? Yes, same link, um, but I'll, it'll just take a few minutes for the recording to be saved first. Okay, okay, great. And then, so some, so I think all that we were, so we the places that we were interested in was Fukuoka, Tokyo, but Tokyo seems to be a little bit out of our. Uh, yeah, but if you kind of go our area or Tokyo area, we can go physically see. Yep. Uh, it's too far. Can't. Well, maybe <laughs> if you wanna, if you wanna look at places that'll be easy for you to visit, maybe we can also look at Chiba City, Saitama City, Yokohama City, yeah. Yeah. and maybe Kawasaki. That's all yeah. within easy reach for you from Tokyo, right? Yeah, and then he he's working in Japan too, so the time is just limited. Just why well, I, I can make uh, I can be a little. Okay. Um, I, but but we do have um three days where we're gonna be in Tokyo. Um, yeah, we plan it. We plan it because her parents want to watch the kids. What dates are they? Uh, I think eight, nine, ten. Okay. But you guys talk on the email too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So um, we'll, we'll figure it out. I mean. If it's Tokyo, we can probably organize a local English speaking agent. I mean, you, you got Saudi son anyway, so we can organize any agent to come and show yeah. you particular properties. It doesn't have to be English. Yeah. Um, so just yeah, give us some heads up and we'll do some research in advance and we'll um we'll hook up some viewings for you. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so you were asking about the purchase process. It basically yeah. It basically takes, um, from the moment an offer is accepted, because there might be a few rounds of negotiation or whatnot, from okay. the moment an offer is accepted, because you're overseas, I would say about two months. If you were here in Japan and could provide all documents kind of instantly, maybe a month, month and a bit. So, because I plan on being in Japan for a month and a half, roughly. So I, I was hoping to do a lot of the preliminary, preliminary stuff now. Well, the owners, and, the preliminary stuff we can do, but the ownership transfer requires documents um, because you don't have a hanko and uh, like a seal certificate, then you would have to get notary public to witness it anyway. Okay. Um, which in your case, I mean, you could maybe do it at the Tokyo American Consulate. I think they could notarize um, maybe cheaply at short notice, but I'm not sure. So okay. I can look into that. Yeah. Okay, so but uh, well, again, yeah. similar, same as with the viewings, we usually get hired to do everything so that you don't have to be here physically. So you're welcome to, but you don't need to. Okay, that's cool. And then, so 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 we're talking about uh, the yield, and then let's say, how is how is rent normally paid in Japan? It it does it's paid does, into the property manager's account, and then they deposit it into your account. Or if you don't have an account into our account, and then we give you an annual statement, and you tell us when to remit funds to. Okay. Okay. And then what what do you charge for your 
for your property management? So there's going to be a property manager in place, uh, a company that's actually in touch with the tenant and find new tenants uh, when it's mm -hmm. vacant and take care of maintenance and repair. We work with the property managers. So we're your, okay. um, your proxy or your portfolio manager. And we mm -hmm. work same as we work with the real estate agent for the purchase. We work with the property managers for the management, with the building management company for monthly fees. So we work with all the third parties on your behalf. Mm-hmm. And then we charge, um, well, I mean, at the budget you're talking about, it's going to be um, just our minimum charge, which is one hour per month, which is about 3,000 yen. Okay, so not bad. Okay. Yep. 3,000 yen a month? 3,000 yen a month, right? Yep. Yep, 3,000 yen a month. Okay. And then, and then, because um, I, I noticed that you were saying that the insurance is cheap in Japan, nothing like in the states but we would need insurance to cover earthquakes obviously and yep fl fl flooding and firing and then you mentioned that in a rare case that people unfortunately do pass away in their apartments and that would be another insurance that to cover that is that correct yeah so you've got your normal property insurance which is for um natural disasters fires um <laughs> water damage that kind of thing mm -hmm. and then if you've got a tenant in there you also want landlord insurance just in case they do happen to die in the property which can occur especially if they're elderly but we even had a 50 something year old person die in a property so i'd advise to get that for any property with a tenant in it okay and that's an extra four to six thousand yen a year it's not much as well oh, that's not bad at all that's like negligible Okay, so the insurance. So that's your calculated the um in a eighteen percent, you said before. That's, that's running costs, man monthly management costs. So that one we don't factor into the purchase costs. We factor that into oh. the running costs. But you'll see it in the spreadsheet as well. Yes. So the, the bottom line yield that we give you at the bottom of the spreadsheet, which is net pre-tax, is going to be including your insurance costs as well. Okay. okay. You, you'll see it all broken down. I'll, I can share a screen and give you an example. Give me a second. Oh. Uh, let me just find somebody who purchased recently. Um, this one. So, share this. You seeing it? Uh, yep, I see it now. Yes. Okay. So, this is a post settlement. Uh, oh, no, this is a pre settlement. Yeah, pre settlement sheet. I'll show you this one, then I'll show you a post settlement one. So, when we're evaluating a deal, we still don't know all the bottom line costs. So, all we can have is assumptions at this stage. So mm -hmm. here we put in a worst case, this was a really cheap property, so it's not 18%, it's a bit different. But here we put in the worst case purchase costs. Mm -hmm. And then by the time we go to settlement, it'll just get lower than that because we're assuming a worst case, but actually legal and registration, we can discount a little bit. The agent fee is not going to be so high. Purchase tax is also assumed worst case. So it'll only improve by the time we get to settlement. And here you can see again assumed because we don't know um, final costs at this stage but here you can see how much uh, worst case insurance might be how much the property manager charges how much the building fees are and how much mm -hmm. our fees. so mm -hmm. this is purchase costs and this is all running costs okay okay and then the bottom line down here shows you how much you're getting in rent um how much it actually works out to be on a monthly basis after all of those costs are calculated so you see here the difference is rather big between 39 the actual rent in pocket is 21000 a month and the total return at the bottom is going to be 4.3 net pre tax annually so you'll see okay, all so of this yeah and then wonderful let just, yeah let me show you one that so do you show you the left is is how much yen he's getting, right? 
but then after you subtract all the the costs and everything, mm -hmm. you see it on on the. On the so he's only what? monthly rent. He's only getting fifteen, one hundred fifty. Right? It was after all the expenses. So about, but it's still it's still annual for a year. He still gets four percent. Is that yen? Yeah, it's yen. But then you convert it to euro. Oh yeah. If... Yeah. And then, you... and well, then, for this customer, yeah. 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 Um, no, not this one. Arm. Go away. Yeah. So we'll have something like this yeah. for our case, yeah. which is really great. That's great. Yeah. That's what you want to know. Yeah. So here is really. one. I'll show you mm -hmm. one. I'll show you what it looks like after settlement when we've got more numbers um, mm -hmm. to share. Um, stop share and then start sharing this one. <clears throat> I'll need to go in five minutes, though. Sorry, I've got a 1030. Okay. Sure. Yeah. This is per thank you for the time. No worries. So after settlement, it looks like this. Then we already know exactly how much the real realtor fee was, how much the legal and registration was, how much our fee we obviously know in advance already. And we uh -huh. still don't get the purchase tax right after settlement. That takes another few years, uh, a few months, sometimes up to a year or two to arrive. But we can safely assume it's going to be worst case this much. Mm hmm. We already um, have a better idea of insurance, but still an assumption at this stage because we actually get the policy a few days after settlement. Um, and then we narrow everything down. This don't, don't expect to get that. That was a good few years ago, I think. Oh, no, okay. that, was, that was just now. Because uh, he bought from an existing customer, so we could retain the high yield. Yeah, sorry, ignore that. And then mm -hmm. we'll give you a more accurate percentage of what you're... And also notice here on the right, we give you... Um, uh, attractive features for the unit, building mm -hmm. renovation history, how much they've got held in uh, reserve funds, what they've done in the last few years. Um, and if you have a tenant, we'll have tenant info here as well. So we, we narrow it down and we give you more accurate prices as we near settlement and even more accurate after settlement and so forth. Great. Great. This is exactly what we want. Yeah. So I guess I next steps would be for you to maybe decide what you want to do during your visit, where you want to go, if you want to just look around Tokyo, if you want to look in other cities, if you want to actually look at potential properties, or if you want to just have a, you know, get an understanding of neighborhoods and, and the city. And so, I mean, let me know what you're planning to do during your trip. And then after the trip, you can decide if you want to immediately purchase something that you've seen or you want to continue the process remotely. You'll probably have a better idea by then. I'm guessing. Yeah. So, so moving forward, so we we can send you properties that that we would be interested in, and then because um, we'd have like about two weeks before we fly to Japan, and then you would send us properties, and then we can kind of narrow down our our search, so that when we hit Japan, we're like we'll have maybe three or four properties that we're interested in, and then we can look at them physically, and then we can just take it from there. If you're here for a month and a half, that'll work. Yeah. 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 So I, th I think that's what we'll do. Not a problem. Um, bear in mind that properties, it's a very fast market. So properties you're looking at now, if nobody submits an offer within a few days, somebody else will definitely submit an offer if the deal is attractive. So it's best to maybe look at actual available properties a lot closer to when you're actually going to be ready to go and visit them or go and have someone visit them. So if you're looking now and you're going to come back to them in a month and a half, they're definitely going to be gone. That's what I mean. Okay. Yeah, wow. I didn't expect it to be that kind of a market. On the cheaper end, which is what you're looking at. Yeah, it's a very fast mm. market. It's the world's second biggest market. So that it's supposed to be that way. Which which means that when we sell, we can easily sell, right? Very, very our... much. Yeah, very much. Very. I, I mean, as if you price it right, if you're asking for something that's not feasible, no. <laughs> all right. All right. So, so then, um, I guess I'll get an email from you, um, with the proper paperwork, and then I'll I'll get it notarized, and then we can move forward. Um. Yeah. So, email me with um everything we've just discussed: your search criteria, the cities you want to think, what you think you want to do during your trip, and so forth. And I'll reply mm -hmm. with the engagement documents, and then we'll start researching. So, you send me properties you want; I'll send you properties that we found that suit, and so forth. And we'll take it from there. Thank you. Sam. This was, uh, okay. and and I want to say I love, like you have so much content out there, and I we 
we've been consuming it almost every day for the last couple of weeks. Through, so we really, that. really appreciate hearing that. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So I will. It was nice meeting you. Finally. Nice you. Yep. And yeah. Look forward same to- here. Yeah. <laughs> Speak to you soon. Yes, speak to you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. So there you have it. Well and truly back in the saddle now, folks. Huge apologies again for being gone so long. Hope you've enjoyed the chat and I promise to see you again very, very soon. Now, before we go, we're also, as always, going to tell you and also link to our other sponsor's website. That's Hiroshi Shimizu, immigration lawyer and administrative scrivener. If you're thinking about moving here on a more permanent basis or you're already in Japan on some sort of a temporary visa and you want to switch to a longer term or permanent one, or if you're considering setting up a local company or a branch office of a foreign company and you've got any sort of business or visa related inquiries, or even if you just want to find out what your options are on any of these topics, feel free to contact Hiroshi Shimizu. You can find him at japanimmigrationexperts.com and he can help you set up a company, apply for any kind of visa, or just provide you with the best advice and extremely affordable consultation related to these topics. And he's already done that for many of our listeners. So feel free to reach out to him. Again, that's japanimmigrationexperts.com and you'll be well on your way. And that's it from us for today, folks. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Japan Real Estate Podcast. Do share it with your networks and please let us know what you think. So leave us a short rating or review on the iTunes store, on Spotify, or just drop us a line in the comment section of wherever you might have found this episode. We love hearing from you. Hope to have you with us again next time. And until then, have a great day or night ahead. Yoroshiku! Yoroshiku!